So we've been talking a lot about business development uh, and working on your business rather than in your business lately. And I think this is a really important area that most entrepreneurs are just totally clueless about and really struggle on the different areas of their business. And so I wanted to jump into that because you are the business architect, you're the business expert in crafting these businesses and helping people set these things up and remove the roadblocks and go to market. So there's just so much that we can talk about today, but I think first and foremost, I wanna let everybody know who you are, what your qualifications are, and uh, kind of how you got started. Sure, well thanks Adrian. So I'm a 30 plus year veteran of the food industry and uh, I've been with some big companies like Nestle, General Mills, worked my way up the, the management ranks. And then I went to some middle market companies and worked my way up to be president of uh, three different food companies, uh, you know, American Seafoods, uh, Eskimo Pie, and then CEO of, of Java City. And so I did that for 30 years. Java City is locally here, an international company based out of Dublin, Ireland. And so I had a great career there, uh, the, the experience of, of running a small company, $8 million company, all the way up to $420 million company. So I've been blessed with the opportunity to see scaling at different levels and know the, the different types of levers you need to push to be able to get from one uh, tier to another and scaling your business. So very helpful from that. And then also in structuring the organization. So I've been doing what I've been doing now for the last four years, because I found that really my core purpose is about helping leaders and businesses reach their full potential. Yep. So now I'm a business architect and uh, I help the CEOs and business owners design and build great companies. And I do that in a number of different areas. I, I lead CEO peer groups, CFO peer groups, that's one business. The other business I spend a little more time in is really working one-on-one -on -one with business owners, CEOs, and their teams, building capacity, you know, strengthening all aspects of their business so they can really build the foundation to scale. And then beyond that, to, to go from being a, a good company with a strong foundation to being a great company with a strong valuation. What I say, I, I could teach the foundations of management. So I teach the, the, uh, you know, the foundational way to, to really to give expectations to your team, a very clear way to do it. Um, and make, make sure when you're giving the expectation that you're asking their opinion, hey, what are your thoughts on this? They agree to it. And they agree to it. They improve the expectation. Rarely done. Typically, the manager dictates this is the way you need to do it. And they're like, okay, whatever. So, and then I have them play it back. So, did you, we make sure we're aligned, right? And then how do you give feedback on how it's going well? There's a certain way to praise somebody. But more importantly, the scary conversation when it's not going well. Right, I see a lot of this react and judge. Hey, why did you do it that way? Or why didn't you get that done? And a big frowny face and the look through that could look through you kind of face that, yeah. that really is not good. And I teach more of a non-judgmental feedback. Hey, here's what I saw, non-judgmental. There you go. What, what happened from your perspective? So you're kind of investigative reporter, you're yep. drilling down to you get to the real issue because you could find out that maybe it wasn't their fault. They weren't trained real well, that they had to react to a situation that was a little bit outside the playbook. Mm -hmm. And now you don't have a disgruntled uh, employee. You're saying, hey, good intentions. And, and I, I think in this case at work, but this is why this is the expectation. And let's get you back on the expectation. What are you going to do differently? How can I help to get you back on the expectation? They buy in totally. So there's, a, there's an art and a science to, um, in a simple way, to, mm -hmm. to provide feedback to your employees that will be uh, not threatening, but hold them accountable, but will we'll also get them uh, to where they're engaging and, and, and they're holding themselves accountable and, and performing. So uh, something that I did this week, I posted a video last week on human capital. And this week I posted a, a video on intellectual capital. And this next following week is gonna be a video on financial capital. And so I wanted to kind of bring that up with you and have you touch on that maybe a little bit to just kind of solidify what I've been talking about and how important it is. Um, and maybe kind of just put myself in the hot seat, if you will, of uh, making myself the, the test dummy here. But what, sh what are the most important factors from your perspective on you know, human capital, fi uh, uh, intellectual capital, and, and uh, financial capital? Sure. Well, taking intellectual capital here first in mind, uh, again, when I see companies stop, they, they stop innovating. We innovated, home run, knocked them all in the park this year, high fives, and we stopped. 
Yeah. And so there's got to be a continuous flywheel going. That's the intellectual capital, I believe. And, and there's a process I created called a 12 quarter build that really ensures that you continuously look out in front of you what's out there, forecast it, what are the choke points, and how do we can adapt our products and services and evolve them to the next level so we continue to innovate and stay ahead of the competition. So that's got to be a continuous cycle. So intellectual capital, it's, it's uh, investing in, in bigger data, right? Investing in research, um, investing in capability in terms of technology, things like that, that's going to make it better, faster, cheaper type thing, uh, whatever that is. So it's, it's having both of those elements in line, but it's driven by the mindset that you're going to continuously peer out into the future, understanding the dynamics of what's going on around you and how that will change and what the trends are and they continue on, extrapolate. What does that mean for my competitors? What does that mean for my customer? How is it going to impact my customer or consumer? Whatever it is, geopolitical, all those factors together, you know, what are the choke points and what are the opportunities that can come from those areas of, of, of issues out there that we can capitalize on now and so what I like to see is a continuous, we've got a quarter of, of things we're working on that are here now. Mm -hmm. And then there's, a, there's also that same quarter objectives. There's some things we're working on that are going to impact next year and the year after. So it's not like we're going to just magically get into 2021. Hey, I think we should be doing this. What's too yeah. late? You know, some of these things are like six to nine month ramp times to build it. So okay. it's continuously getting in that mindset. And that's tougher for smaller companies that don't have an R&D department, things yeah. like that. They're going to have to bring in outside horsepower to their uh, board, their advisory boards, whatever it is, advisors yeah. like myself that can help them think through that. And who do we need to put on a team to help us be bigger, right? And, and have these creative ideas and so forth. That's right. So that's yeah, we work, we work very agile. That's, that's one of the issues. And, and being so agile, you tend to, to not look too far ahead because you're just focused on making it work in the moment and making those adjustments on the fly and pivoting and adjusting. And I think that's a really important takeaway for people here is to be able to be having your, your short-term plans, but also have your three, six, nine, 12 month, 24 month plan. Perfect. Yeah. And, and from a people capital standpoint, I'm a big believer that, that um, you, you bring people on board for what you want, not a job description, but for what you want that position to actually accomplish in the next two years. Uh, and what are the deliver? What's the mission of that role? What are deliverables? For instance, you can look at, okay, I want to bring in a, a head of sales. Great. But this head of sales, the mission is to double the business. That's right. right? So job, a job description, ordinarily wouldn't say that. Will you handle, create a uh, market plan, hire <laughs> yeah. people, but it doesn't say that. But yeah. if you're saying that, then I'm looking for people that have actually doubled the business, right? So, uh, so you, you kind of think about the type of people you need, the, the behavioral characteristics, the skill sets. Have they done what you want them to actually do? And what is that level of talent you need for like now and over the next couple of years? And more importantly, too, just as much, I think, is do they fit culturally with, with your company? I believe in having a set of core values and a core purpose for your company. Core values have descriptive behaviors of each core value. Yep. And so you're like hiring for those core values. So a mistake I commonly get is they fall in love with a person right away. Oh, this person's great. They've knocked it out of the park, but they're not thinking about the, the value side, the cultural fit, and you end up being one step forward, two steps back because they're just raising havoc in the company and just destroying the company culture. So so you got to look at both of those things. And over time, as your business grows, there's a different level of expectation in it. You may have outstripped the capacity of that individual. And so you have to have a real heart to heart conversation. Hey, this is your skill set. This is your top tier skill, but we need this <laughs> and we can't get you there. You know, you're going to, we're going to keep you in this role. We'll take care of you. love you and all that, but we're going to need somebody here. But I see a lot of times they, they, project that person upward yeah. and it's not the right fit and the company stalls out and because they feel loyalty to them. But I think you're, you're doing a, a disservice to the company by the fact you're not really putting somebody in there from a success standpoint. Does not mean they can't be valuable still to the company? Yeah. Uh, or you can then, if it's not in the company, can help them find you know, a, a career that is uh, really leverages their top tier skill. So that's you know, something on that. The financial side, uh, 
Yeah, it's pretty, for me, it's fairly cut and dry. It's, it's being uh, well-funded. It's, it's all about uh, telling your story. And if you've got a highly differentiated story to tell, you're a strong entrepreneur, you've got a good team around you, you'll, you'll get the money. And then, of course, it's just managing your, your, your finances uh, well and have the skill set internally for somebody that can do that well or outsourced that can help you uh, to do that exceptionally well. Right now where I'm at, and I think this is where a lot of the people that follow me are at, they have digital marketing agencies or graphics companies or you know that type of business, creative businesses. I deal a lot with that just because my YouTube channel has a lot of those people that are following us. Um, and you know, heavy labor, heavy you know, mindset, creativity, stuff that's hard to replicate. And so they're trying to figure out ways to scale their businesses and go from being the one person show freelancer, you know, working on Upwork or on one of those freelancing websites to having a team like I have with the Bryans and the Ians and the Chris's and, and the whole team behind me. Then going from that to like, okay, now how do I take myself out of the picture even on the sales side and let this build this business so it can run itself? And that's really where I feel like you're going from that six-figure business to the seven-figure business, right? Sure. And not that I can't, I, I'm going to be 100% just abandon the business, but I can now focus my time on working on it, doing more business development stuff, innovating, and really focus on building the relationships that are going to help that business grow exponentially. So that's something I wanted to bring up to you and just bring my own situation where we're you know, in the high six figures moving into seven figures, what are some of the things that I need to be watching out for as I'm scaling my business up? Sure, well I think to, to start with to getting to a solopreneur to starting to go toward a uh, million dollars, it's like a broken record. I'm saying, how are you going to be different? Different, better, forward looking, how are you gonna to communicate to the market that you're different. And then, uh, and I'm sure that's exactly what you did, Adrian. You wouldn't be the size you are. You are saying, I'm looking to lay the land here. Here's what I see. Here's me. I'm driving down this lane and it's different. And obviously it's working for you because you're growing and starting to scale. So to me, that's the biggest thing, right, at first. And then to find um, some people around you that can help you scale. What do you need at that particular point? What's the next position you need to help you scale? Is it a Salesperson is it somebody who could do the work of the work? Is it a creative person? It, what it just depends on the business, right? What is that next person that's key? Uh, and then what are the advisors I need around me and make you know some uh, um, people for rent hire, whatever you want to call it, contractors. So that's a kind of a tough word to use with AB five out there in California. <laughs> whatever you can do legally these days uh, to get help around you. To, um, to fill those gaps that you need uh, based upon how you're differentiating yourself you know, for the future. Uh, build relationships and channel partners. Channel partner growth in the service company is, is, is unbelievably helpful. So yeah. find somebody in adjacent uh, services that, that are going after your same target customer. Build relationships with them, help them be yeah. the go-giver. And all of a sudden they become referral partners and start to you know, get your, uh, your revenue and lead generation machine, which nicely you're not even paying for that because it's there. And of course, that's not going to probably fulfill everything. You need great companies like yours to help you get out there and lead gen and you know, polish up your brand so it's differentiated, that type of thing. So for you, then you, your business going forward too, it's kind of looking at, okay, so what's going to get me from the here to here? Uh, what does that look like, I think, in my company? What yeah. kind of organization do I need? what kind of a customer base will get me from here to here? Um, and then how do I go out and get that customer base? What do I need to do strategically different than what I'm doing today to peel that customer base? And who do I need to help me get there? Is, do I need to hire salespeople? Can I automate some of that? I, I don't know, because I don't know the situation. Yeah. So you gotta kind of watch that. Um, I know there's gonna be a few people that are like, man, I need this guy's help. I wanna architect my business. Uh, what's the best way to, to reach you? How can they get a hold of you? Figure out. Uh, C Hetrick at hetrickgroup.com is my email. Uh, yep. They can you know catch me at hetrickgroup.com, but typically my email um, C Hetrick at hetrickgroup.com is the best place. But yep. thanks for having me on, Adrian. Uh, you got a lot of great thinking yourself there. Uh, nice to see that, and uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day. God bless you, and as always, keep looking up.